six, five, four. Today we're going to have a, a hearing, a subcommittee hearing on transmission infrastructure for renewable energy. I'm really looking forward to this hearing. I think this is a hearing where uh, we're going to have a lot of consensus, some differences, I'm sure, in, uh, but I am really looking forward uh, to uh, listening to all members of the, of, of the subcommittee and also all of our witnesses. So we're meeting today to hear testimony on renewable energy transmission and the role of public lands under committee rule 4F. Any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help members keep to their schedule. Uh, without objection, uh, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Uh, as described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. With that, I'm going to begin my opening statement. I just returned from the COP26 uh, uh, in Glasgow with, with Representative uh, Levin, uh, where our congressional delegation discussed the pressing need to reduce emissions with leaders from across the globe. The stakes are incredibly high. Failure to act will have catastrophic consequences. And the United States is in a unique position to help lead the world through this climate crisis. That's why President Biden has committed uh, to 50 to 52% reduction of emissions by 2030 and 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2035. Reaching these goals will take a transformation of the electricity sector. We'll need to ramp down our use of fossil fuels and importantly, ramp up renewable energy like wind and solar. Our nation's public lands have a big role to play in this transition. As we've discussed at several hearings already this year, public lands and waters hold tremendous renewable energy resources. Last year, Congress passed bipartisan legislation directing the Bureau of Land Management, or the BLM, to permit at least 25 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2025 and President Biden set an ambitious target of permitting at least 30 giga gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. These clean energy resources are expected to power millions of homes across the country. But as we all know, new wind, solar, geothermal projects are useless if we can't bring all that much needed clean energy onto the grid and into our homes and businesses. Unlike coal, oil, and natural gas, which can be transported by truck, pipeline, or train to power plants near where the customers are, the only way to transport clean electricity from wind and solar is by transmission line. Unlocking our full renewable energy potential 
will require substantial increases in transmission infrastructure. The poles and the wires that bring electricity from their source and into our homes and businesses. Now, I don't want my colleagues to be alarmed. You, you're not accidentally wandering into a hearing on, of the Energy and Commerce Committee. While the oversight of the electric grid and transmission is primarily under their jurisdiction, we are here today to discuss the role of the Department of Interior. From the growing offshore wind industry in the Northeast to the huge solar potential of the Southwest, it is clear that the build out of new and upgraded transmission infrastructure will require use of our public lands and federal waters. The Department of the Interior needs to be prepared. The department's permitting role is also a chance now to build a better future. The fossil fuel industry has a long history of building energy infrastructure in low income, tribal and minority communities, exposing those communities frequently to disproportionate amounts of pollution. While new renewable energy projects reduce pollution, lower energy costs and create jobs, we are still going to need to ensure that the clean energy infrastructure, including transmission, does not repeat these same mistakes. We, this time for the clean energy economy, we can and will do better. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Bureau of Land Management must minimize environmental impacts, we must respect input from tribes and local communities, and it must consider environmental justice all the while serving to promote the growth of renewable energy. We'll hear today first from Jenea Scott, counselor to the secretary at the Department of Interior. She'll be able to update us on what the agency is doing to prepare for this upcoming need. We'll also hear from witnesses from the public, from the private and the nonprofit sectors to hear how they're planning ahead for transmission infrastructure on and offshore and why it's essential for clean energy transmit transition. As you all know, just, a, just over a week ago, Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, which includes billions of dollars for transmission infrastructure, and the Build Back Better Act includes even more. I look forward to, to both bills getting signed into law and working with the Department of Interior to make sure they're at the table as we expand transmission for renewable energy. With that, I thank the, the witnesses for being here, and I recognize Ranking Member Stauber for his opening statement. Welcome, Ranking Member Stauber. Oh. Great. Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, in Minnesota and throughout the Midwest, the gales of November are here. It's getting colder. Temperatures are dropping more and more. Parts of my district received up to eight inches of snow just this past weekend alone. While temperatures plummet, energy bills are going up. The Energy Information Administration is estimating a 54% increase in propane alone this year. For those that don't know on this subcommittee, that's a big hit when it reaches 60 below for weeks on end. Americans are worried they won't be able to pay their bills and buy Christmas presents or afford the full Thanksgiving meal their family deserves. Why? Joe Biden's self-imposed crisis after crisis, whether it be supply chains, energy, or inflation. Most pertinent to this subcommittee is Joe Biden's energy crisis, which is single-handedly making life more expensive at a dangerous time of the year 
in my district alone. With this backdrop, with this backdrop, we are discussing today the need for siting transmission for renewable energy in a hearing titled Plugging in Our Public Lands. To quote, plug in, America needs generation and transmission requiring critical mineral resources and regulatory reform. Unfortunately, it's well known how unattractive development and siting of transmission projects are on federal lands leading stakeholders to painstakingly avoid federal land when possible, let alone compliance with a broken NEPA process that serves as little more than a lawsuit haven for trial lawyers and activist groups who charge hundreds of dollars an hour to inspect every T crossed and every I dotted and file injunctions to halt development repeatedly. Therefore, I find today's hearing to be particularly rich coming from my colleagues across the aisle. Democrats have spent decades building up this impenetrable network of federal regulations hand in hand with activist groups, creating a near inability to permit transmission on federal lands and waters. Now, with Joe Biden's ambiguous climate goals, Democrats are finally realizing that empowering radical groups to sue every infrastructure project <laughs> offered may not have been their smartest idea. And to my colleagues across the aisle, you are lying in the bed you made. It did not have to be this way. For example, a key transmission project that would help reach these climate goals is the Trans West Express project. Surely, citing power lines to develop renewable energy is something Democrats can get behind. Nope, the Trans West project is on year 13 with an estimated five more years at least to go. So what does the administration do? Voluntarily remand a permit at the request of their activist allies of a massive renewable energy transmission project, putting it on path to maybe finishing just short of two decades, maybe finishing just short of two decades. And to reiterate, Joe Biden set renewable energy goals and discusses how we need transmission to reach those goals. When an actual solution came across his desk, he does his best to kill it. In contrast, take the approach by Republicans in this space. We have long advocated for reducing headaches and permitting. Representative Garrett Graves offers the Builder Act, which would fix many of the solutions offered today. Representative Russ Falcher, representing Idaho and its rich geothermal resources, offers the Enhancing Geothermal Production on Federal Lands Act, which creates a narrow categorical exclusion for exploration of geothermal resources. And Rep Representative Scalise American Energy First Act, which provide, provides a host of common sense energy reforms. All these solutions would solve the problems we face today. But instead, every solution offered has been shot down due to the far left's strict adherence to the religion of anti-development. Another example is the administration taking offline part of the Duluth complex in my district, which contains 95% of America's nickel reserves. And we just recently added to the critical mineral list because someone at the White House finally realized you might need nickel to make a battery. Instead, the administration plans to import solar panels made with slave labor because human rights is, quote, this is, this is uh, climate czar Kerry's quote, not in his lane, in his productive trip to Scotland when he was asked about slave labor in China for the solar panels. His response was, it's not in my lane. We can do better. And Democrats are now calling for more transmission lines how do they solve that problem? By remanding permits for tr transmission projects, co-sponsoring legislation that would make it harder to comply with federal statutes, rolling back President Trump's common sense NEPA reforms, and refusing to give hearings to renewable energy bills introduced by Republicans. In closing, I look forward to discussing the problems at hand with laying transmission lines and hearing from Mr. Fisher, an expert on the topic from Basin Electric Cooperative. And to my House Democrat colleagues, remember you have a choice. Will you support policies that streamline the regulatory process and allow transmission lines to be built? Or will this hearing be worth nothing 
And will Democrats in Congress and the Biden administration continue halting any infrastructure development whatsoever? Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Stauber. I now recognize the Ranking Member of the full committee, uh, Ranking Member Westerman, for an opening remarks. Well, <laughs> Representative Stauber. Uh, Re Re Representative Westerman. I got to turn this around. Hold on one second. Thank you, Chairman Lowenthal, and thank you to the witnesses for taking the time to join us today. The great potential for renewables on federal lands and in federal waters is well known. Unfortunately, it is also known that federal lands and waters are not attractive places to do business. The overlapping network of federal regulations makes building anything on federal lands more difficult and expensive than almost anywhere else in the country. And I will take that almost out of there. It is more expensive than building anywhere in the country. Uh, it also creates more uncertainty than building anywhere else in the country. At the same time, this administration has set aggressive timelines for renewable energy development with the ultimate goal of decarbonizing the electric grid by 2035. My question would be, what's the plan for the next three years? It's easy to set goals for uh, to 2035 uh, but I think it's unrealistic that these goals will be achieved under the current framework. And uh, I would really like to see what this administration actually does in the next three years and what kind of goals they have, because uh, they're operating under a system that's very unfavorable towards development. This will require a rapid scale up of renewable energy generation and transmission with intermediate targets such as 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in just nine years. Given that transmission projects, projects regularly take 10 years or more, the administration is already way behind schedule. Because we likely will not be able to meet these unrealistic goals, we will continue to rely on reliable base load energy sources to keep our families warm during cold winters like the one uh, that we're shaping up to have. Despite these goals, we have seen my colleagues across the aisle ignore Republican-led initi initiatives to fast track renewable energy development on public lands, an issue that everyone in this room or on this Zoom should agree on. If we're going to take renewable energy development on public lands seriously, I encourage our colleagues to work with us on two crucial areas, meaningful regulatory reform and securing our critical mineral supply chain. Countless renewable energy projects have been delayed or canceled due to endless litigation under the National Environmental Policy Act the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and the Endangered Species Act. We must engage in serious reform if we ever wish to see significant increase in renewable generation and transmission on federal lands. Other challenges abound, including stiff local opposition and widespread challenges from environmental groups, but federal regulation is one issue that Congress can address. Further, while I appreciate that some in the administration have finally acknowledged that increased renewable energy will drive up the demand for critical minerals, I have yet to see the majority advance domestic mineral development. And just a few weeks ago, President Biden took steps to begin locking up lands in my friend Mr. Stauber's district. This would cut off hundreds of thousands of acres of precious mineral resources, including copper, nickel, and cobalt. Nickel, for example, is one of the crucial components of electric vehicles, and global demand will spike from 2.5 million tons to 3.4 million tons by 2024. That's surpassing all known supply. I was pleased to see nickel join cobalt on DOI's critical minerals list this year, but that very same department is taking active steps to shut down one of our most promising domestic deposits. This Congress, some of my colleagues across the aisle have professed abstract support of mineral development for renewables, but every time a specific mining project comes up, we hear, not this mine, not this place. The Resolution Copper Project in Arizona is another example of this. The administration, my Democratic colleagues, and the rest of the nation needs to make some tough decisions about where their priorities really lie. This administration cannot call for new transmission capacity on the timeline that's been laid out, and at the same time, block access to the materials and permits needed to build it. If we choose not to face the reality of inadequate mineral supply chains, 
in a spider webbing nightmare of overlapping regulations, a vibrant U.S. economy powered by significant renewable energy resources will remain simply a fantasy. I thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Rep uh, uh, Ranking Member Westerman. I am now happy to welcome our first witness. Mr. Chairman, I think you're muted still. Am I muted? I don't think so. Am I, can you hear me, folks? I, I think so. I, I, I don't believe I am muted. We can hear you, Alan. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to welcome our, our panel number one, our first witness, uh, Ms. Jenea Scott, who is the Senior Counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals at the Department of the Interior. Ms. Scott, welcome to the committee. You are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the transmission of renewable energy from federal lands and waters. I am Jenea Scott, the Senior Counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management. And in that role, my focus is on the department's renewable energy portfolio. In one of his first actions, President Biden issued Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, to restore balance on public lands and waters, create living wage family supporting jobs, and provide a path to align the management of America's public lands and waters with our nation's climate, conservation, and clean energy goals. As part of tackling the climate crisis, the administration is committed to advancing the nation's transition to a clean energy future. The department recognizes the foundational role its bureaus, including the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, will play in achieving these goals. Modernizing and expanding the electric transmission grid is critical to unlocking access to renewable energy across public, private, tribal, and state lands while improving the reliability and resilience of electricity delivery. Regarding the onshore, the Bureau of Land Management manages approximately 245 million surface acres, located primarily in 12 Western states and mineral resources across 700 million subsurface acres under the multiple use and sustained yield mandate as directed by Congress. The Bureau of Land Management has permitted 34 solar projects, 36 wind projects, and 47 geothermal projects. When taken together, these projects provide enough energy to power roughly 5 million homes. And as the largest federal land manager in the West, the Bureau of Land Management plays a key role in planning critical energy corridors and siting transmission facilities. Development of utility scale renewable energy generation and transmission on public lands requires thoughtful planning. The BLM is always striving to facilitate access to high potential areas that maximize utility and minimize impacts on environmental, cultural, scenic, and social resources. With respect to connecting renewable energy and transmission, the Bureau of Land Management is currently working with its federal partners to undertake a review of existing Section 368 energy corridors. And based on this review, the BLM will consider adjustments and appropriately update corridors on public lands to help increase renewable energy production. The BLM is also actively working on several large scale bulk energy transmission projects like the 10 West link between Arizona and California and the Green Link West transmission project in Nevada. We anticipate these transmission lines will facilitate thousands of megawatts of renewable energy. And in fact, as one example, BLM has received seven new utility scale solar project applications, all of which are expected to connect to the Green Link, Green Link West transmission line. Additionally, the BLM also processes transmission connections that directly support renewable energy development that is not on federal land, and the BLM works to expand energy storage as part of renewable energy projects. Shifting to the offshore, Secretary Holland has outlined the path for future offshore wind leasing, which will help meet the administration's goals to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. This ambitious path forward envisions up to seven new offshore lease sales by 2025. These offshore wind efforts are driving the establishment of a robust U.S. domestic supply chain for offshore wind. And offshore wind is an essential component of a resilient clean energy economy. 
Ensuring that the power generated by offshore wind can be incorporated into our nation's grid is a complex issue that will require an all of government approach. And a planned approach to transmission is needed to avoid and minimize environmental and community impacts while also being compatible with other ocean users, equity concerns, and increasing grid reliability. Federal agencies, states, utilities, grid operators, and others have begun efforts to address key transmission challenges to ensure that offshore wind can meet its full potential. So in conclusion, the department is committed to responsibly mobilizing the abundant renewable energy resources of our nation's public lands and waters. The department will continue to, to prioritize the nation's clean energy and climate goals, and we look forward to continuing to work with this committee and the Congress. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Th thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. I wanna remind the members of the committee that Committee Rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. Chair is now gonna recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask for our first panel. I'm gonna recognize myself first and uh, Councillor Scott, I wanna follow up on things that you have touched on and follow up on some statements that I made in my introductory remark. We have highlighted, Ms. Scott, that the need for the Department of the Interior to be at the table when it comes to the build out of transmission infrastructure for renewable energy. What do you see as DOI's role in transmission planning? Yes, I think the Department of Interior's role on transmission planning is um, we've, we've got a role both onshore and offshore. And it is to understand where the projects are going to be and make sure that there is a, a pathway for transmission to connect those projects to the places where people are living and require energy. On the offshore, it's oftentimes uh, a little bit more limited, the places where the transmission can come onshore to connect. And so making sure that we are proactive in working with our partners in the states and, um, and, and other agencies can, can really help us with the transmission planning and making sure that we have the ability to connect the renewables we're bringing online to the, the load centers where people live. I wanna follow up on that. You know, when it comes to the siting of wind, solar and geothermal projects, the department, the, the department has embraced the uh, so-called smart from the start approach, whereby the department identifies preferred areas for development. Can this same area be applied to transmission siting? Yes, absolutely. And that has taken place with some of the Westwide Corridor work that we have done where we have looked to see where uh, the lowest conflict with the lowest, lowest resource conflict areas for building transmission. And again, trying to identify the places where, where you have uh, excellent generation potential, the lowest conflict areas for connecting that transmission then to the, to the load centers. So we can do planning like that. Uh, we are poised to make some revisions and updates to some of the 368 corridors to make sure that they really do align and uh, help facilitate unlocking the renewable energy that's being developed and, and getting that to the places where people live. Thank you. My last question uh, for you is that uh, Congress and President Biden have set ambitious goals for renewable energy generation on public lands and for offshore wind. My Republican colleagues have said that uh, given uh, uh, some of the issues on regulatory regulations, that these are unrealistic to have these goals. So my question is, how is the Department of Interior thinking about transmission planning and siting in the context of achieving these goals? Yes, modernizing the grid is absolutely critical to being able to achieve these goals. And of course, making sure that the renewable energy can be transmitted to where people live is another key component of, of, <clears throat> of meeting these goals. We have done an assessment and we recognize that we need additional resources to work on these topics. 
we're looking through to see what projects are being developed, uh, when and where, so that we can be thinking through where transmission ought to go with that. And we're also looking at a few programmatic uh, options to help facilitate and make the, the development of renewable energies and transmission um, easier. You know, looking through wildlife concerns, again, looking for those low priority areas. You can always work with your, your local BLM Bureau of Land Management person. They oftentimes know the landscape very well in terms of where some of the least resource conflict areas are likely to be. And, and those are always great places to start. Thank you. I am now going to recognize um, ranking member Stauber uh, for five minutes of questions. Welcome, ranking member Stauber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Scott, thank you for joining us today. As a former employee of the Environmental Defense Fund, would you commit to recusing yourself from any lawsuit filed against transmission projects under Interior's jurisdiction by EDF? I would need to spend some time talking with the conflicts of interest attorneys and get their best advice on what to do there. And then will you provide uh, this committee uh, your recusal list? Um, yes, I would be happy to provide the committee the recusal list. I will work with the department to get a response for you. Thank you very much. And then in your testimony, you discuss permitting a significant amount of energy from wind solar and geothermal resources uh, on federal land. Can you tell the committee uh, approximately how much copper is in one windmill? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to exactly how much copper is in one windmill, but I'm, I'm happy to take that back to the department to get a response for you as well. You, you don't have to, I can tell you about 7,000 uh, pounds per windmill. And then how about critical minerals in the solar uh, panel space? Can you tell the committee about critical minerals and the importance of them uh, when we uh, adapt and trans uh, transform America into the solar uh, arena? How many, how many critical minerals in our solar panels? Do you know? I don't know the exact number of the amount of critical minerals in the solar panels, but I, the administration does recognize the importance of critical minerals, and there are many departments that are focused on this. I know that the White House um, released a set of reports that came out this summer and that we do support domestic production. We think it should be sustainable with strong environmental environmental justice and labor standards and input as we I, develop. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I appreciate the answer. And you, you mentioned labor standards. Uh, you're aware that uh, U.S. Special Envoy uh, for the Climate, John Kerry, claimed that ensuring solar panels we import are not being built with child and slave labor. He said, when questioned, that was, quote, not in his lane. Do you think uh, uh, not supporting child slave labor is something the United States and the Biden administration will support? So my preparation for today kind of focused on the transmission of uh, renewable energy. And so I'm, I haven't been involved in discussions about this. Well, Ms. Scott, I just want to ask you point blank. You don't support child slave labor to mine minerals that we use in this country, do you? No, I do not support child slave labor. Can you confirm that all of those uh, of those permitted wind, solar, and geothermal resources will not be built with child and slave labor? I am. I that, that I would have to do a little bit more digging into that topic. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, that's something that I'm also happy to take back to the department to get a response for you. So you can't you can't confirm to the committee today that the uh, solar panels, critical minerals that we purchase as the United States will not be will not be born from child slave labor. You can't answer that today. I, I don't know where the companies who are who are wanting to build these uh, projects are are purchasing from. I don't know. Okay. You would rather purchase those critical minerals from the United States where the environmental standards and the labor standards are the best, correct? Yes, I absolutely support domestic production. And are you familiar with the Duluth complex in northeastern Minnesota that can help with our with the the uh, adaptation to alternative sources of energy in the district that I represent, ma'am? I am sorry, I am not familiar with that issue. I, I understand that it's important to you. I heard it in your um, opening remarks, but I, I don't have any more details on that. Yeah. As we as we move forward, 95% um, of the nation's nickel reserve is in that complex. It's called the Duluth complex. 
88% of the cobalt reserves are in that complex, other platinum metals, and over a third of our copper is in that complex. The administration just sh shut that down for a 20 year ban. They're paving a way for a 20 year ban. Did, are, were you aware of that? I, I did not, I'm sorry. My, my preparation today focused on the, the renewable energy and transmission. What I'm trying to get as it, it's connected. You can't adapt to alternative sources of energy with wind and solar without using the critical minerals that we can mine here. It can be a win-win. Uh, so what, what we're talking about today is one thing and, and, and the administration is talking about another. They're paving a way for a 20 year ban on, on, a, on a complex, a copper nickel find that's the biggest in North America. So it, it's not congruent with the administration's thinking, uh, and uh, and I appreciate your response, Mr. Chair. How much time do I have? I, you're on mute, Mr. Chair. I just ran out. Okay. Thank you, Ranking Member. I believe you've exhausted your time. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Scott, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. I now recognize Representative Levin for five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Chairman Lowenthal. Um, Councillor Scott, it's great to see you again. I'm proud to see a fellow Californian in such an important role and uh, really glad you're able to bring your expertise and perspective from your time working in California uh, to your current position. Uh, as you know, our public lands must play a crucial role if we're to achieve President Biden's goal of a carbon-free electricity grid by 2035 and Congress's goal of permitting 25 gigawatts of renewable energy on our public lands by 2025. Meeting these targets will be challenging and undoubtedly require a whole of government effort. But I assure you that my colleagues in Congress and I are committed to being good partners uh, with you and with the department to meet these national targets by advancing efforts to responsibly site transmission lines and renewable energy on our nation's public lands. And with that, I'll turn to my questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you about uh, BLM's transmission planning and certainly appreciate the effort uh, that's been put into the West Wide Energy Corridor since the passage of the Energy Act of 2005. And while I agree that designated preferred right-of-way corridors for electricity transmission siting is responsible, the 2016 Argonne National Laboratory Corridor Study makes clear that the West Wide Energy Corridor plans have fallen short on a number of fronts, especially when it comes to renewable energy projects. So my question is, what is the agency doing now to make sure transmission corridors work for renewable energy developers for example, can we do a better job making sure that wind and solar priority areas align with transmission corridors? Yes, and that is absolutely what we're doing. We're looking at the transmission corridors to try to make sure that they are aligned with solar energy zones, with wind energy zones, with new areas where there may be wind or solar development. Taking a look also at the section uh, 368 corridors and, and looking to see what needs to be revised, what needs to be updated. Are there things that we should just take off the table because um, folks are not gonna build there and so that people are not spending time looking in areas where transmission may not make sense. We also process uh, applications for shorter transmission lines that come along with uh, renewable energy projects whether they're on BLM land or on uh, non-BLM land. So we help facilitate transmission in that way as well. Thank you for that. Uh, does BLM currently take transmission needs into account when it considers renewable energy and land management plans? Yes, it does take transmission needs into account when it considers renewable energy in its land management plans. I, I think it's really uh, pivotal in making solar and wind development on public lands more financially and practically feasible. Um, one thing I did bring up with Secretary Holland when she testified before this committee back in June is the concern that the costs to build renewable energy on public lands often don't reflect fair market value. Uh, for example, the rents and fees for renewables can be up to 10 times market rates, meaning renewable energy development is prohibitively expensive. Uh, as you know, the Energy Act of 2020 gives the Secretary more authority to adjust rental rates and capacity fees for wind and solar if they exceed fair market value. And I was very pleased to see in June that BLM in California adjusted rents for renewable energy projects uh, in Riverside, San Bernardino and San Diego counties. I, I wanna make sure that, well, that's a great step that it's done on a, a nationwide level. And I uh, wanted to ask you if the department has any updates about more comprehensive efforts to update lease regulations and make federal land more appealing for renewable energy development. Yes, absolutely. We are 
have pulled together a renewable energy rulemaking in August. The Bureau of Land Management um, put out a notice. We had about four listening sessions that we held uh, throughout September. There was tribal consultation that went along with that as well, so we could hear from industry, from the conservation community, from any stakeholder who was interested in renewables about the types of actions BLM could take in order to really facilitate and make it smoother to, to build on uh, Bureau of Land Management lands. And some of the actions that we are looking at are um, uh, utilizing that Energy Act of 2020 authority to um, reduce rental rates. And that, that's one thing that we're looking at in that space, as, as well as screening and prioritization and uh, thinking through competitive leasing, how long should right-of-way grants be, lots of things like that that would really help facilitate renewable energy on BLM lands. Thank you. And, and on a related note, what's the status of BLM's rulemaking related to rights of way and renewables? Yes, uh, on, on our website, it says early, 20, uh, early 2022. So please stay tuned for a draft. Thank you. Well, I look forward to that. And, and with the time I have left, do you just want to explain how that rulemaking will benefit transmission projects on public lands? Yes, absolutely. So that that rulemaking will help to uh, to standardize across BLM how we approach different pieces of the of transmission, and also think through the places where we will see more solar, wind, geothermal development, and how to ensure that the transmission is connecting that to the to the to the grid and to um, the people who use energy. I'm out of time, but I just wanted to thank you again uh, for all your good work and look forward to following up as uh, these uh, proceedings develop. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll yield back. Nice to see you. Thank you, uh, Representative Lesson. I now call upon the full committee's uh, ranking member, ranking member Westerman, for five minutes of questions. Mr. Representative Westerman? Can you hear me? Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we're having audio difficulties. I can't hear you on this end. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Scott, uh, thank you for being here today. I was, I had a whole series of questions I wanted to ask you about transmission. Hopefully I'll get to some of those, but um, honestly, I was a little bit taken aback by your responses to Mr. Stauber, so I wanted to follow up. Um, you seem to be unaware of the issue with the, uh, the cobalt and nickel deposits in northern Minnesota, and I know your title is Senior Counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals at the Department of Interior. Uh, I would have assumed that you would have been briefed and been aware of, of that large mineral deposit and this administration's uh, actions to take that mineral deposit out of production, which will make us more dependent on foreign countries and uh, uh, even countries who, as Mr. Stauber said, you child slave labor. And Scott, are you aware of the, uh, uh, the copper mine in Superior, Arizona? I did. I did. I heard about the copper mine just previously with Mr. Stauber. Um, you know, I'm not involved in discussions about this as part of my role at Interior. So you're a senior counselor to the Secretary for Land and Minerals, and you don't get involved in uh, copper deposits on federal lands. Are you aware that the uh, the uh, big reconciliation massive spending bill had a 350 million dollar line item in it to close down that copper mine that could have supplied uh, 20 percent of the uh, u.s demands for copper over the next 50 years i'm sorry i'm not up to speed on everything that's in the bill this, this well, is now, um, now that you're learning about that in my preparation for today would, would you think that would be good policy to close down domestic copper mines and make us more reliant on foreign sources i would i would have to take a look at what that said i do know that we're supportive of domestic production to be sustainable and to have strong environmental environmental justice and labor standards to go along with it well, i know you're saying you're supportive of it but the administration that you work for is actively trying to shut down domestic mineral production uh, across our country and making it more difficult for uh, 
for businesses to do domestic mineral production. So you can say one thing, but the actions of the administration are totally opposite from, from what you're saying. And that makes me very suspicious of anything that you all are trying to do uh, uh, with transmission, with renewable energy, if you don't even understand the basic uh, uh, facts of what's going on with domestic mineral production here in this country. Um, you know, another thing that confuses me is there's a, uh, BOM is currently looking at leasing an area off the north coast of California that could produce a gigawatt or more of energy, uh, but with the capacity of transmitting only 150 gigawatts. When the Interior Department makes leasing decisions, what are you doing to make sure that eventual transmission projects are built? Yes, this is a, a, a complex and complicated space. Oftentimes, the renewable energy developers are looking to build the renewable energy project, and then you have your transmission developers who are looking to build your transmission projects. We're always working to try to make sure that those things connect with one another because it not, doesn't make sense to have renewable energy that we can't deliver to load centers, and so that transmission component goes hand in hand with that. Does it make sense to permit projects where you don't have the transmission uh, permitted? Oftentimes, these, these things go hand in hand. They're complex. The, the transmission developers are looking to see when are those renewable energy projects coming online. The renewable energy project developers are looking to see when the transmission is coming online. And we're typically working to try to get both of those things on, online in a time frame that works both for the, the renewable energy developers and the transmission providers. And Ms. Scott, going back to the Obama administration, um, there was there have been a lot of efforts to build transmission lines across the Midwest uh, to get uh, wind, wind from or energy from wind farms and solar farms in the west to the east. And uh, one of those transmission lines was going to go uh, through my district, and it could have went entirely on uh, or almost entirely on National Forest Service land, but the uh, the people building the line wanted to put it across private land because it was too difficult to work with the federal government on getting a transmission right away. Uh, are you uh, committed to working to put these transmission lines across federal property and staying off of private property? Yes, we are committed to getting transmission lines across uh, public lands, yes. Well, that hasn't been the, uh, the record of any administration going back and the developers of those uh, power, those transmission lines know that. They know that if they can, uh, and, and what they would like to do is use intimate domain to uh, condemn private property because it's so difficult to deal with the federal government. Uh, but that's about par for what we would expect or, or what I would expect when I see how difficult it is to develop minerals or even to manage our forest on federal lands. I'm out of time and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Westerman. I now recognize Representative McCollum for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I just want to review a fact sheet from the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor from the Washington, D.C. Uh, as you know, under the U.S. Uh, Tariff Act of 1930, the Department now of Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs is charged with refusing any goods identified as made by forced labor, including children. And in 1999, the United States ratified the International Labor Organization Convention, uh, which uh, works to end the worst forms of child labor, uh, forced labor, and anything with a minimum wage. So we can talk about cocoa, we can talk about all kinds of things, but the Foreign Affairs Committee is on top of it. Um, my, my, uh, I have a comment and then I have a question. Um, there was a lot of contention and a lot of, um, you know, just disruption when the Dakota Access Pipeline was being built, in part because the Army Corps of Engineers, when they had built a transmission line, actually ignored treaty boundaries. Um, so we need to make sure, and I noticed in some of the planning and some of the things that I read, that we're going to do our due diligence to engage with tribes early and to make sure that the Army Corps follows this, not only the spirit of the law, but the spirit of treaties. And um, Mr. Stauber and I had the wonderful opportunity of working with some of the Minnesota tribes and one of our utility companies. When people are engaged in early, treated with dignity and respect, you can have great outcomes. 
Ms. Scott, I serve on the Appropriations Committee of the Department of Interior, and, uh, and we have had um, a lot of rancor uh, going on in BLM with a lot of people that have quit because of the, the move uh, to uh, out west from Washington, D.C., and a lot of staff disruptions and a lot of um, things that just weren't funded. So my question to you is, does the Renewable Energy Coordination Office, RICO, uh, need further appropriations? Is the office staffed appropriately now? And what further support from Congress would RICO office need in order to operate at full capacity? And I think that's a nonpartisan question. I think we all want you to be able to do, do your job effectively and efficiently. Yes, we do want to be able to do our jobs um, efficiently and effectively. We have developed um, a plan for the renewable energy coordination offices that we believe would help us bring on enough people to be able to process the renewable energy applications that we have before us, and also to put in place some of the, the, the broader programmatic things like uh, Representative Levin and I were speaking about in terms of updating rentals or um, competitive leasing or right-of-way grants. So that is underway. Is there anything more you would like to add? I mentioned the Dakota Access Pipeline as being a, uh, the way not to engage um, people, um, you know, tribes just telling them you're going to cite something in, in what was actually treaty uh, protected land. Um, and then I gave an example in Minnesota where our state and our and our tribal nations and, uh, you know, Mr. Stauber and I worked, worked together to have a good resolve on that. Could you maybe enlighten us of what you're planning on doing with tribes in the Western Energy Corridor in the next uh, minute? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are certainly reaching out to tribes to do formal consultation. Um, we are also always willing to have um, meaningful and robust discussions in an informal way as well. I agree with you that uh, speaking with folks early and often is, is the right way to go. You really want to hear, um, listen to concerns from all sides and understand what the impacts are going to be and then see if you are able to, to bring that into some of the decision making that you do. And I, I apologize, there is a leaf floor outside. I hope that's not coming through here. Um, and I think one of the other things that we often can do is you are able to see how the input that we receive from tribes and others change the shape of the project or change what a project may look like or, or timing on a project so that you can see that the input that we're receiving uh, is meaningful, it is um, absorbed, and oftentimes you can see that come back uh, re reflected in some of the decisions. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you for your service. Mr. Chair, I will be sending to the clerk of the committee uh, the fact sheet that I cited from the Department of Labor. We keep hearing these uh, uh, comments about child labor, and the United States government does not support child labor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Representative Graves for five minutes of questions. Welcome, Representative Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and I want to thank uh, Ms. Scott for, for joining us today. Uh, Ms. Scott, do you know how much money um, in revenues from renewable production on federal lands uh, the, the U.S. government brought in last year, for example? Yes, the U.S. government from uh, wind and solar projects brought in about forty million dollars last year. On on federal lands, about forty million. And, and land, I assume yes. I assume that that revenues in order to run your agency and to be able to go through the NEPA process and 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 other government functions is pretty pretty critical. Yes, and we have uh, cost recovery accounts that are often set up for renewable energy projects, and that helps to cover some of the cost of processing. So, so Ms. Scott, where I, I struggle, so you're talking about $40 million um, in, the, in the offshore production of conventional fuels. We've had years in recent history, where we've brought in nearly $10 billion, $10 billion, which as you know, pretty much all goes to the, the general treasury. Um, and that is used to fund everything from environmental programs, it funds the EPA, it funds veterans programs, healthcare, it, it, it funds infrastructure, it funds our federal government. And so the, the efforts now with this administration to effectively shut down conventional energy production and changing it for renewable uh, whenever we've actually been able to demonstrate that in many cases conventional energy production uh, can be done while being environmentally competitive with renewable sources, 
that doesn't seem to make sense to me because we're losing the revenue and all we're doing is we've seen the president's national security advisor turn and ask countries like Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Venezuela, and other countries that don't share our values and certainly don't share our respect for the environment, asking them to increase production. How do you reconcile that? I think with uh, oil and gas revenues, I am not surprised to hear that there are, are greater right now than renewable energy revenues. There are millions of acres of oil and gas. It's been around for centuries, for a generation. There are thousands of acres of renewables. They're just getting going um, and they've been around for decades. So it'll, it'll take time for renewables to catch up. Um, I do know that there are, um, that the production is still, is still going quite strong. There are thousands of uh, permits that are not being used uh, right now. And so we have a time in between as we're making this transition to be really smart and be really thoughtful about it and think about as, as um, you know, the oil and gas is gonna continue for years into the future, but as the renewables come online more to take a look and see how, how much revenue do we have? Where would we like to put it? There will be time to have those types of thoughtful dialogues and conversations. But, but, but I guess, I guess my, my point is that what we're watching, we're watching this administration, we're watching the leadership in this Congress come in, increase royalties on offshore energy production, impose up to a $10,000 a mile per year fee on pipelines, submerged pipelines below 500 feet, um, you're, you're watching the regulatory being heaped on. All you're doing is making domestic energy production uh, uh, cost prohibitive. And then in the same breath, asking other countries that don't respect the environment and have, for example, Russia, much greater methane emissions associated with their energy production, asking them to produce more. Do we care about the environment or do we not? I just, I really don't understand how these things make sense. Secondly, I've been looking very carefully at some of the changes in the in the regulatory structure that have been put forth by this administration, including concepts like saying that you can value intangibles, which is a just an oxymoron in itself. You can value intangibles as you work through the regulatory process. If we're going to take, as, as Ranking Member Westerman noted, our stranded assets and actually bring them to market, if we're going to realize the benefits of these renewable energy projects, you can't heap more uh, uh, crazy ideas on the regulatory process that you can't even measure and expect that you're going to be able to deliver these things. It's just going to add more time to the process, more expense and more delay to where you can't realize your benefits. So we're going to result in greater dependence on foreign energy, less revenues for the United States Treasury to pay for environmental programs, health care, veterans and other critical needs. And, and, and this just none of it makes sense. Can you can you explain? That was that was a that was a broad question. I mean, I, I know that this administration believes in energy independence, that oil and gas will continue for years into the future. But we do need to make sure that our energy policy aligns with our climate and jobs policies as well. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe I'm out of time, but this is just baffling. I just asked for common sense. That's all common sense. Representative Graves, uh, I now recognize Representative Tiffany for five minutes of questions. Welcome, Representative Tiffany. Okay, Mr. Chairman, am I aboard? You're aboard as much as you would like to stay aboard. Okay, Ms. Scott, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, you really got some tough questions to deal with here, and I hope you'll take that information back to the administration. Uh, first of all, do you measure endangered species deaths when you're doing these projects? Yes, the Bureau of Land Management works closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and there are absolutely mitigation and monitoring plans that go along with these renewable projects. Are you familiar with the term flamers? Not familiar with the term flamers. I think it's flamers, um, not 100 percent sure, but it's where solar farms are built and you have um, birds in particular endangered species fly through them. The heat's so hot that it it it, it, it roasts them. They they incinerate in the air. That's what happens at some of these uh, solar projects. Um, does it concern the administration 
that we could have another boondoggle like Solyndra. If you remember back in 2009, something similar to this was being proposed. And I think it was like three or $4 billion were spent with a bunch of wealthy people that built uh, the Solyndra project. They went bust and the American taxpayers were left on the uh, hook for $4 billion. Are, can we be assured that this isn't gonna happen again? I think what we are looking at here, I'd kind of like to pivot back to the, the role that the Bureau of Land Management plays and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management play, which is, is being able to uh, do the environmental reviews for things on our, for energy on our nation's public land and energy on our offshore waters. And we do uh, the best that we can to carry out uh, excellent environmental reviews and to understand what the impacts of those projects are going to be. Um. So we're talking about carbon free. We heard from the representative from California he said we're going to have a carbon free future. Can you assure us that no uh, fossil fuels are going to be used in any phase of production, transportation, uh, installation and production of uh, electricity by the use of fossil fuels for windmills and solar panels? They're supposed to be carbon free. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you asking me about the supply chain that goes along with yeah, will any will any carbon will any carbon be used in the whole process? Within the within the manufacturing process for these, uh, that I, I I don't know the answer to that question. That's something I'm happy to take back to the department to get a response for you. Because we're being told we're going to get a carbon free future, um, I'm skeptical because I'm sure China, when they're producing those solar panels, they're probably using fossil fuels. In fact, probably coal as they continue to build more coal plants in order to be able to build those uh, uh, solar panels in uh, China. By the way, just so we're all clear here, we are trading by having solar panels and windmills being built in China and other countries that detest us, and they're building coal plants. So we're gonna get intermittent power because the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine every day. And they're gonna get base load power, which is gonna be so good for their industry. And it's gonna be really harmful for um, for our industry. Um, at Martha's Vineyard, they refused to put in windmills a number of years ago because they didn't want to have that blight on their oceanfront views. Um, are you going to respect local control when you have to go th uh, through a particular municipality or whatever? Um, and they say, we do not want this here because it'd be a blight on the landscape. I think all of these projects tend to be complex and we will work with and listen to all of the stakeholders who are engaged. We're, we're committed to hearing all of the voices of the stakeholders and considering them in the decision-making process. Yeah, so thank you very much for the answers that you've given today. Folks, once again, what we see here is the green fantasy. And let's be real clear. We on the Republican side are for an all of the above approach. But what's happening here is we're talking about a very narrow amount of electricity that's produced in the United States of America that's going to gain the full benefits of the United States government while not helping those, um, those things like coal, natural gas, and other forms of electricity, uh, nuclear, we're not helping them. That does not make any sense. And I would just close by this. So I'm for an all of the above approach, but it should be all of the above and we should be doing it that way. The final thing, it deeply concerns me, the answer I heard earlier in regards to reconciliation, not familiar with the line item stopping domestic mineral production. So think about, we have someone from an agency that deals with a very, very narrow uh, amount of the reconciliation bill and not sure of the answer. And I can understand why she doesn't have the answer. How much confidence can we have that we are going to get a full review, a comprehensive review of this reconciliation bill coming up this week when someone who's in the existing agency does not have an answer and we don't have any answers of the cost of the reconciliation bill. It is, it is being done. This process is being done in a way that gives the American people very little confidence that they can trust the numbers. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Tiffany. I now recognize Representative Harrell for five minutes of questions. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you uh, holding this hearing and I can just tell by the dialogue that there are just a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Um, we all know that burdens and re uh, federal regulations are one of the many inha uh, inhibitors to building infrastructure on public land. Um, among the federal regulations that create so much trouble is the Endangered Species Act, and especially in places like southern New Mexico, along with the uh, greater southwest region. And we've seen a huge uh, uptick in the Endangered Species Act, and now this has become almost the epicenter for ESA listings. Um, and a proposed listing of major consequence to, at today's hearing is the lesser prairie chicken in New Mexico and West Texas. So, Ms. Scott, what, I, what I'd like to ask is, in my area, the Natural Rural Electric Cooperative Association submitted public comments to the Fish and Wildlife Service that raised major concerns related to the proposed listing of the lesser prairie chicken and how it would affect both existing and new transmission infrastructure. What is the department doing to ensure that listings like this one don't sabotage existing and future transmission um, uh, infrastructure? Yes, I think that the Bureau of Land Management and our Fish and Wildlife Service work directly together, hand in hand, to, to uh, analyze projects as they come through. It's important for us to follow the law. And oftentimes what we're looking to do is avoid impacts if we can. If we cannot do that, then we look to minimize and mitigate for those impacts. And that just requires an, an ongoing daily dialogue with the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and oftentimes with the state departments of wildlife as well. Right. Because Well, what we hear is that a lot of times multiple stakeholders, uh, we hear from just a lot of people and a lot of stakeholders how uh, various BLM offices, field offices, have different processing uh, processes in place for for permitting uh, certain projects, um, and so the problem it seems to be almost um, systemic across BLM as it's occurring uh, with the permitting process for oil and gas leases on BLM lands. So, is the department doing a review of what your field offices are doing as it relates to uh, determining best practices? Yes, we work to make sure that there are best practices and as much consistency as we can uh, nationwide. Um, but there's also some autonomy that we give to the field and district offices because every field area, every district area is not the same, right? And so it's not necessarily, it's not a one size fits all that works all the time. And so you wanna make sure that there's a little bit of leeway, a little bit of latitude to uh, be able to really address what's, what's going on locally on the ground and have the ability to listen to what folks are saying and balance that wide variety of interests. Right. Now, do you, do you think uh, policies and regulations like the ESA is going to have any kind of impact on these uh, transmission lines as they go across uh, public lands? Well, we will certainly uh, follow the, the law of the Endangered Species Act. And I think, again, what we need to do is work hand in hand closely with one another to be uh, sure to identify the lowest conflict areas and then in places where we're not able to avoid conflicts to, to look and see whether we can minimize or mitigate, look for alternative routes, things like that. N none of this is easy because there are not any empty spaces out there. It, it really does require folks to work together closely with one another and, and problem solve in real time. Right, because, well, I just don't want there to be a double standard where, for instance, the administration and the department is holding oil and gas production on public lands to a different standard as it relates to the Endangered Species Act, for instance, the Lesser Prairie Chicken, where we will actually shut down production because of it, even though millions of private dollars have been invested in, uh, in creating a habitat. And I just don't want to see oil and gas stifled and stymied because of ESA regulations and yet transmission lines uh, be able to plow ahead. So I'd appreciate if you could keep our uh, our um, committee here informed as to what you see as you start moving across public lands and how these Endangered Species Act regulations um, are going to have, you know, I want to see that they're going to have the exact same impact because I agree with Tom Tiffany, you know, I'm an all of the above type person, but I don't want to see a very important industry, especially to my state, uh, hamstrung by regulations and not um, have the same set of standards applied to uh, the uh, green energy field. So um, thank you, Ms. Scott, again, for being here. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Harold. Uh, I want to thank Councillor Scott 
for her valuable testimony and for all the members for their questions. Uh, that This concludes our first panel. Ms. Scott, members may have some additional questions for you, and we ask that you respond to these in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. Ms. Scott, thank you again for coming to our committee and testifying, and you're now free to go. Thank I'm you for the opportunity. I'm going to now introduce our second panel of witnesses. Mr. Robert Bush is the chairman of the New Mexico Renewable Energy Transmission Authority. Ms. Yvonne McIntyre is the Director of Federal Electricity and Utility Policy, Climate, and Clean Energy Programs at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Ms. Janice Fuller is the President of the Mid-Atlantic Region of Ambaric Development Partners. Mr. Pius Fisher is the Vice President of Transmission at the Basin Electric Power Cooperative. Let me, let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining. I recommend that members and witnesses joining remotely use stage view so they may, quote, pin the timer on their screen. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning the witnesses. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bush for five minutes. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Bush. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, <clears throat> as already mentioned, I am the chairman of the New Mexico Renewable Energy Transmission Authority, what we commonly call RITA in New Mexico. As you can see from my bio, I'm an engineer and I have an extensive background in the business of power generation and transmission in the United States. Before I explain a little bit about RITA and its success in developing high voltage transmission in New Mexico, I would like to help you understand what is at stake here. I'm sure by now most of you are aware of the many promises made by states all over the U.S. with respect to the elimination of electric generation that emits greenhouse gases. The majority of these make commitments that the generation that emits these gases will be eliminated by the middle of the century. This will not happen without an enormous increase in the amount of high voltage power transmission. The thousands of miles of transmission necessary will not be built unless you change the laws governing transmission siting in the United States. No amount of federal money will fix this. Some background on RITA. New Mexico has some of the most extensive and valuable wind and solar energy resources in the United States with 137,000 megawatts of excellent wind and 824,000 megawatts of high quality solar on state and private lands. Yet New Mexico has virtually no transmission infrastructure to access them. RITA was formed to help develop transmission and storage to cultivate this unique opportunity. Within a few weeks, construction will be completed on the Western Spirit Transmission Project. RITA's first 
public-private transmission development project. It's the first major transmission line built in New Mexico since the 1980s. This project was initially identified by Rita in approximately 2011 through a study done by the Los Alamos National Labs. Western Spirit's a relatively small project. It's 150 mile, 345,000 volt AC transmission line. Once in commercial operation, which is expected literally within about 40 days, 800 megawatts of newly developed wind power will flow through the Western Spirit transmission line. Rita's had to overcome significant challenges to achieve these successes. The Western Spirit project, was the not, which does not involve any federal land, has been 10 years in the making. The project transmission line right away traverses over 430 separate parcels and encompasses approximately 500 miles of access right away. This required over 750 separate agreements with landowners. Another RITA partnership is the Sunzia project, which does cross federal land and has already been in development for approximately 15 years. It is currently focused on completing the Bureau of Land Management's environmental impact statement process. Construction is planned to start in 2022 with 2025 targeted for commercial operation. The EIS process has been a significant factor in slowing the development time frame for the Sunzia process project. Transmission developers know where to site high voltage transmission projects to access new solar and wind. Transmission developers also know how to get high voltage transmission projects financed and constructed. The real challenge is the time it takes to get all the required permissions and approvals. This is especially true if an EIS is required for a project. A recent study by the Council on Environmental Quality found that on average, EIS completion time was 4.5 years, with more than one quarter of the EISs performed taking more than six years. To meet the zero carbon goals by New Mexico, set by New Mexico and many other states, agency review deadlines must be firm and calculated in months, not years. In addition, federal and state agencies need to find a way to conduct permitting reviews for large transmission projects concurrently. The standard for review and, ap and appeal for permitting processes should be set high enough to discourage frivolous appeals or worse, appeals carefully designed to delay final approval. Let's face it, we all know the appeal process has been subverted into a weapon to kill projects. To be clear, Rita is not advocating for any reduction in environmental, cultural, or other relevant regulatory standards. Rather, federal regulatory agencies need sufficient staffing, resources, deadlines, and incentives to assess and approve projects in a much more expedited fashion. We have the technology in the United States to achieve the zero carbon goals so critical to our energy and climate future. Yet without a significant improvement in the transmission capacity of the existing grid, we will fail to meet these goals, possibly even by the end of the century. Congress needs to understand some compromise on the endless regulatory and legal hurdles, no matter how well-intentioned the individual reviews might be, must be enacted if we are to make renewables work. After decades in this business, I fully understand it will be extraordinarily challenging to pass legislation that addresses issue, issues as touchy as raising the standard of review for appeals and expediting the appellate process. However, you cannot and will not eliminate carbon-based generation unless you summon the political courage to do exactly this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. McIntyre for five minutes. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. And good morning, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is Yvonne McIntyre, and I'm the Director of Federal Electricity and Utility Policy 
at the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. Founded in 1970, NRDC is an international nonprofit organization of scientists, lawyers, and environmental specialists dedicated prote to protecting public health and the environment. Prior to joining NRDC, I spent over 30 years in the power sector as an electrical engineer and in government affairs. As the United States faces increasingly severe climate change impacts, it is imperative that the nation accelerate actions to decarbonize our economy. The electricity sector, which accounts for the nation's second largest share of greenhouse gas emissions, can be rapidly decarbonized by deploying more clean energy resources, both on and offshore, including on our public lands and waters. In parallel, our electric transmission system must be expanded and upgraded to accommodate the changing electricity mix and to improve the reliability and resiliency of the system. As we move forward with this process, it is critical that we do it smartly and take into consideration the impacts of these projects on the environment as well as on communities of color and tribal and low-income communities, which have often faced the most harmful effects of climate change, pollution, and land impacts caused by fossil energy infrastructure. Congress recently directed the Department of Interior to site 25 gigawatts of wind, solar, and geothermal capacity on public lands by 2025. And the Biden administration has set a target of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2030. With such significant expansion in both on and offshore renewable capacity over a relatively short period of time, it is imperative that the decision-making process balances a wide range of interests and appropriate uses of public resources. Doing so can speed the transition away from fossil fuels and provide a host of economic and environmental benefits. But in order to realize these substantial benefits, the transmission system must be improved. Currently, Insufficient transmission capacity prevents many new onshore clean energy projects from connecting to the grid. Weak interconnections between regional power grids are also limiting access to thousands of megawatts of existing low cost renewable power generation. And the future development of offshore wind requires a new transmission network and also presents an opportunity to connect states and regions to each other. A modern onshore and offshore transmission system can move low cost renewable energy from where it's generated to where it's needed. This enables balancing of the variability of wind and solar power on a national scale, which leads to a more reliable grid and lower cost for consumers. But despite the many benefits provided by improved transmission, its build out has been stymied across the country due to broken planning, siting and permitting processes. Greater interagency coordination better coordination be between state and federal governments and increased focus on system-wide planning can facilitate the improvement of the transmission system. Key tools and policies that will be helpful include using smart from the start principles to facilitate better transmission planning and providing assistance and support to impacted communities to ensure they are included in the siting decisions and that they are not saddled with unacceptable impacts. The start from the smart approach me smart from the start approach includes identifying and prioritizing areas where new clean energy and transmission projects can be deployed with little environmental and cultural impacts while also ensuring that affected communities and other diverse stakeholders can engage and help shape the project planning and construction process by using this approach many of the conflicts that typically impact permitting and construction can be avoided resulting in more projects getting built on faster timelines Another principle of SMART from the start is to avoid starting something new when the existing system can be further optimized. In other words, we should make the best use of the transmission system we already have. This means using electricity more efficiently, generating clean electricity where customers are located, and increasing the flexibility of the grid through demand side resources. It also means maximizing the transmission we already have by using new techniques and technologies to increase capacity. When true new transmission is needed, we must improve existing planning to tools and models, including reinstating successful processes that have been used in the past. Finally, government agencies can help diverse communities and stakeholders engage in the transmission planning process by providing them with better access to siting and planning analysis data and information, as well as financial assistance to allow them to participate in planning meetings. 
More details on these recommendations and a list of further recommendations are provided in my written testimony. NRDC looks forward to working with the committee on these critical issues. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. McIntyre. The chair now recognizes Ms. Fuller for five minutes. Thank you. I would like to thank Chairman Lowenthal and Ranking Member Sauber for the opportunity to offer testimony at this hearing. Prior to my current position, I spent nearly 10 years working for Chairman Pallone, so it's a particular privilege to be before you today. I'm Janice Fuller, the Mid-Atlantic President for Anbaric Development, a U.S.-based developer of large-scale electricity transmission projects with a focus on infrastructure for offshore wind. We as a company spearheaded the development of $1.5 billion in undersea cables here in the New York region and are currently developing multiple projects that will help deliver offshore wind power from wind farms to the terrestrial grid and have long been advocates for the need to plan transmission infrastructure for new renewable energy. We are at the precipice of a new industry here in the United States that is central to the clean energy revolution. The president's goals that have been much discussed are going to bring the nation to utility scale wind generation in just the next 10 years. For comparison, <clears throat> Europe, which has more than a two decade head start on the development of offshore wind, currently has 35 gigawatts of wind deployed. States up and down the East Coast have set their own goals for offshore wind procurement totaling over 40 gig gigawatts and have contracted for several thousand megawatts to date. These resources will help diversify electric systems that have grown too dependent on a single fuel source, creating greater reliability and cost savings for consumers, as well as increased energy independence. While there's been much celebration of the rapid growth of offshore and wind and the billions of dollars of economic investment and tens of thousands of jobs it will bring, getting the power to shore presents a significant and immediate challenge that must be addressed. To date here in the States, transmission has been approached on a project by project basis using what's referred to as a generator lead or radial line. That's essentially a series of extension cords out to each of the wind farms. If we were only going to have a few projects, this approach could work. But to achieve the goals that have been discussed today, a thorough and planned process is necessary. In a planned system, fewer wires that can carry the capacity of several wind farms are used. Studies have shown this approach reduces the number of cables by well over half reducing environmental impacts and improving system reliability. We must go about planning the needed transmission infrastructure like we would a highway system, not one access road at a time, but rather an efficient and well-planned road network. Strategically planned and competitive, pro pro competitively procured transmission will enable the nation to integrate offshore wind at the lowest cost by minimizing bottlenecks, reducing grid con congestion risks, and including uh, risk reducing the risk of permitting delays minimize environmental and fisheries impacts, and increase competition between wind farm developers. Further, if a planned network designs are used, ratepayers will see the significant benefits of power system reliability and resilience that a transmission system can provide, avoiding the risk of months-long power loss in the event of a radial cable failure. While much of the critique of the renewable energy transition focuses on the cost, we should recognize that independent offshore transmission will increase competition and level the playing field between leaseholders near and farther from shore and drive down prices. In Europe, strategic investment in transition has enabled countries such as the ne Netherlands to deploy offshore wind without subsidies or utility-backed contracts. An analysis by the Brattle Group in New England found that a planned approach to developing transmission for the next round of offshore wind procurements could avoid over $1.1 billion in onshore grid upgrades. And these, the risks of major onshore upgrades are already confronting projects that states have selected and will likely increase as accessible points of interconnection with available capacity are used. Brattle's analysis of the New York region showed the same benefits, stating that a planned approach would save ratepayers nearly a half billion dollars. While the narrative of project on project risk has been spun to advance the position uh, that radial bundles are less risky, the evidence to the contrary comes from countries like Germany, which did not ab abandon plans for transmission, but rather more fully embraced it as a superior approach. This has worked for other countries like the Netherlands, and in fact, even nations like the United Kingdom, which has a best case coastline for extensive radial development, is using toward, moving towards a planned network system, and have found that they will save uh, over six billion pounds compared to an unplanned system. Planning and competitive procurement have enabled multiple jurisdictions to effectively connect generation utilizing shared transmission facilities and have led to subsidy-free wind procurements. 
To those who are concerned about the cost of all this transmission, there's good news. An October 2020 sub study by ISO New England has found that transmission to incorporate eight gigawatts of wind could reduce the production cost of electricity by 50%. What is critical to the future is a strong and predictable role of the federal government in transmission planning. Multiple departments and agencies have or should have a role in the space, including BOEM, which has the authority to award rights of way for transmission lines that will transverse federal waters. BOEM should be given, given the guidance to expeditiously approve corridors that favor the least environmentally impactful transmission system. FERC has jurisdiction over the rules regarding transmission development and cost recovery, both on land and water. Congress could and should ensure that FERC has the guidance to ensure that interconnection rules allow for large transmission first projects that can serve multiple generators. And Congress, through the power of the purse strings, can set up funding streams to procure the investments needed in transmission, again, similar to highway funding, and assist states with the expense uh, of planning and can further expand tax incentive programs to target smart plan transmission. Thank you for allowing me to speak today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Fuller. Uh, I, the chair now recognizes Mr. Fisher for five minutes of questions. Welcome, Mr. Fisher. Good morning, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Stauber and members of the subcommittee. My name is Pius Fisher and I'm the Vice President of, ba of Transmission for Basin Electric Power Cooperative. I've worked in the electric utility industry for over 30 years after earning my electrical engineering degree from North Dakota State University. I'm also a registered professional engineer. On behalf of Basin Electric and the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, thank you for the invitation to speak this morning about transmission development on public lands. Basin is a generation and transmission cooperative that provides wholesale electricity to 131 rural electric cooperatives we serve 3 million customers across nine states, including part or all of 42 persistent poverty counties. We operate a diverse generation portfolio consisting of approximately 7,000 megawatts of wind, recovered energy, coal, natural gas, fuel oil, and market purchases. This electricity is delivered through over 2,500 miles of high voltage transmission, and our gener generation resources participate in two regional transmission organizations. In total, GT cooperatives own approximately 72,000 miles of transmission lines across the country. Basin has made great strides to diversify and decarbonize our electric generation portfolio. As of last year, over 30% of our generation was renewable, and that share will continue to grow with utility scale solar under development. Other electric cooperatives continue to innovate and are adding a record 1.6 gigawatts of new renewable capacity in 2020 with an additional six gigawatts announced to come online. All told, we are extremely proud of our track record and that of the electric cooperative family in reducing CO2 emissions. Basin has gained much experience in the six decades it has been building transmission infrastructure across federal lands in North Dakota and Wyoming, including lands managed by the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. We believe there's a tremendous opportunity to utilize federal lands for both generating renewable electricity and moving that electricity to the load centers. However, there are a number of challenges. Permitting for construction transmission on federal land under NEPA can take anywhere from months to years, depending on the level of analysis. As Basin sought to build a new high voltage transmission line in response to dramatic load growth from the Bakken oil boom, an environmental impact statement took three years to complete. Comparatively, Siting of a transmission line under the state statute of North Dakota can often be done in a period of four to six months. Obviously, the permitting time can be stretched into several years should any party decide to contest the agency's NEPA analysis. Even when a project is covered by a categorical exclusion, approval can take over a year, as was the case when Basin Electric tried to make improvements to a substation on Forest Service land in 2011 and ultimately received approval in 2013. In addition, NEPA regulatory challenges can be brought forth under the Endangered Species Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Generally speaking, the additional time and cost of construction transmission on federal lands means that doing so becomes a measure of last resort for, for electric cooperatives. Policymakers really want to unlock the potential for renewable energy and transmission on these lands. We would make the following recommendations. 
provide clear NEPA guidance and timeframes for analysis, encourage the use of categorical exclusions for projects with no or minimal impact, provide regulatory certainty regarding take of species or migratory birds. Despite the implementation of best practices, bird strikes with lawfully cited transmission infrastructure unfortunately will happen. The federal government should approach transmission development with a coordinated interagency approach. One example is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's or in its Order 1000 principles, including those who receive benefits pays for that transmission. Further, any in initiative should be done in a coordination with the robust planning processes already in place with the regional transmission organizations. Let's make sure we're building the right transmission for the best value. In closing, there's no shortage of challenges as we seek the solutions that balance the need for affordable and reliable energy with reducing CO2 emissions. We support the role that federal lands can play in expanding the deployment of renewable energy. However, I would caution if beneficial electrification is a goal, driving up the cost of electricity due to increased time and cost of transmission is self-defeating. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Uh for your for your uh, testimony, Mr. Fisher. Uh, the chair is now going to recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. The first question is to Ms. Fuller. It's my understanding, Ms. Fuller, that all of Embarrack's current projects are focused on wind transmission. This may surprise some people given that we don't have a single large, uh, sing large scale, single large scale offshore wind farm operating in this country. We only have pilot projects. Can you explain to me why you're all in on the future of offshore wind? Thank you for that question, Chairman. Uh, we as a company um, fully believe that the clean energy revolution is critical for our nation's future um, and that figuring out the best and most efficient ways to deliver that new energy, so those new energy sources to the grid um, are critical to a success. And so we, in partnership with a, a unique investor, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, have been working on the development of these potential transmission projects for nearly a decade. Um, we saw the future, um, the writing on the wall that the nation was going to be moving towards new energy sources. We've had disruption and delay of that perhaps in the past few years, but it's clear that the federal government now truly embraces uh, the clean energy revolution as well. Um, and so we decided as a company to put all of our focus on identifying the states that were most likely to be first movers in the offshore wind space and to position ourselves as a company to be able to assist both in the policy development of, of how best to deliver that power to shore, but also to start deliver the projects that can do exactly what I spoke about in my testimony. Find ways that can bring that power to shore that are going to be the least environmentally disruptive, both in water and on the land and do so in a most efficient way, but also in a way that can provide a new system of resiliency and redundancy so that we can have greater confidence that the power is going to get where it needs to go when it needs to be there. My next question is for Ms. McIntyre. You know, it's clear that we're going to have to double or even triple our transmission capabilities or capacities to facilitate all the new renewable energy coming onto the grid. Uh, and obviously, as we has been indicated, uh, and the focus of this is that this new uh, renewable energy is absolutely essential if we're moving towards a zero carbon uh, future. Yet we know that there's frequently local opposition to new transmission projects based upon the concern of environmental impacts. That relationship between environmental impacts, local environmental uh, concerns, and new renewable energy, does that mean that we're going to have to have support, that the only solution is to have trade-offs between local environmental impacts 
renewable energy. How, how are we going to address this? Uh, that what seems to be uh, uh, this critical issue between community concerns, which are frequent, and uh, the need for new renewable energy? Thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, and unfortunately, there will always be trade-offs that we do need to consider. But the good news is that um, we have tools and experience developed over the last decade to avoid um, the worst developmental impacts. Projects like the Eastern Inter Interconnection Planning Collaborative, California's Renewable Energy Transmission Initiative, and the Texas Competitive Renewable Energy Zone process um, were all facilitated significant transmission buildouts as well as renewable energy development. Most of these processes involve stakeholders from every interest sector, including local and state governments, conservation and environmental advocates, state and federal land managers, and utility and trans transmission planning experts. Using data from myriad sources, they, they develop tools that account for key environmental, historical, and wildlife areas and allowed for least regress corridor planning. So transmission development will always, uh, new transmission development will always be hard um, and there will always be some uh, opposition, but we, we can use these processes that have worked in the past to ensure that there's less conflict as we move forward with these new new, new developments. <clears throat> You're muted. Not out of time. So I'm going to yield back and now recognize the ranking member, ranking member Stauber for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Lowenthal. And Chair Lowenthal, I forgot during my opening statement, uh, I asked unanimous, unanimous consent to put these two articles uh, in the record for this hearing. One is a Reuters article uh, involving uh, uh, John Kerry's uh, a comment about uh, uh, child slave labor is not in his lane. And then another article about uh, emissions that deal with, uh, that, uh, deal with uh, this issue. Um, and if I would just, uh, give permission to do that, I'd appreciate it. Certainly, without opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and I want the panel to understand we can't have renewables without mining. They go hand in hand. You cannot have renewables without mining. And, and, and I've said to this committee as often as I can uh, that uh, mining is, is, has been, a, mining is a, is a uh, 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 so important for critical minerals and uh, th this renewable technology that we're all talking about. You cannot do it without mining. Uh, mining is a path to a brighter future. Um, <clears throat> my first question, Mr. Fisher, thanks for joining us today and I appreciate the basin selling power into Minnesota and into my district in particular. You know, the Trump administration crafted a rule reducing the burden on transmission operators, but Biden's administration changed back. As a nonprofit electric cooperative, can you discuss the cost of complying with statutes like, for example, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and who, at the end of the day, ends up bearing the cost of the of, the, uh, of compliance? Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Congressman. Yes. Uh, so the Migratory Bird Act, uh, under the current rules, when a when a bird strikes one of our transmission lines, uh, that's a that's an action that where we would be at fault. Uh, so, under the under the other rules, in the future or in the uh, in the past administration, a a strike on a bird would have been uh, a bird strike on a transmission line would have been allowed under that MBTA rules. Okay, so so the transmission line would be uh, responsible if a bird flies into it. That is correct. Okay, in northern Minnesota, we have a saying. Is that like those deer crossing signs that you see that you only should be aware of deer at those crossing signs? Uh, it makes little sense to me. It, it really does, and and I uh, it, we we can do better. Thank you, uh, Miss Miss McIntyre. Uh, my next question is for you. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. The Natural Resources Defense Council brought suit in 2009 against the West, West Wide Energy Corridor as a massive project to promote expansion, and in 2020 opposed the Trump administration's NEPA reforms, which would solve the problems we face today. Were you a part of that? 
No, I was not. I just joined NRDC last uh, September, September 20th. Okay. okay. And then on your on the NRDC's uh, China webpage, uh, it boasts about your work there, uh, but says nothing about forced labor of Uyghur Muslims at the solar panel uh, factories. Do you agree with the Biden administration's United States Special Envoy for Climate that solar panels made with slave labor are not in his lane? I do not agree with that, um, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself. I don't work on China issues. Um, I'm pretty specifically narrowed in the um, utility sector work, but you know, I definitely. Ms. McIntyre, Ms. McIntyre, would you agree that the United States should never purchase any critical minerals, any materials that were either mined or produced by child forced slave labor? Yes. Okay. And, and it seems that our U.S. Special Envoy can't come to that conclusion. I, I appreciate the fact uh, that you answered that uh, uh, correctly and rightfully on behalf of the American citizens. We cannot use child slave labor anymore. And right now, this administration is looking at stopping mining in, 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 in the United States, yet want those same critical minerals. And, and, and I'll just share with you that that uh, there's a the the Duluth complex of northeastern Minnesota is the biggest copper nickel find in North America. Ninety five percent of the uh, uh, are re, uh, uh, reserves for cobalt and nickel uh, and uh, a third of the copper. We can do it. You cannot stop mining and expect to have renewables and alternative sources of energy. All of the above energy policy. And I do appreciate your forthrightness in being here and I yield back. Thank you, ranking member. Uh, I now will call upon Representative McCollum for five minutes of questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, you and I met with uh, uh, Special Envoy uh, Kerry when we were at, uh, at the uh, International Climate uh, Conference just last week. Mr. Kerry is a highly respected Secretary of State, does not support child labor, and his words are being taken out of context, but I'll let Mr. Kerry defend himself. He's capable of doing that as a, as a um, person of uh, great respect in the international community for standing up for human rights. Ms. Uh, Fuller, in our previous hearings, we have focused on the tremendous job creation potential in the offshore wind industry. And I think there's uh, potential in, in solar and, and others. In fact, there was a great story just on uh, National Public Radio this morning about enhanced farming in some of the arid areas where solar panels are, are providing shade and less water is used for irrigation and people are able to get in and farm. So we're, we're learning how to do this better and have a multiplying effect on all these uh, new um, renewable energies. But can you tell us a little bit about some of the jobs that are going to be associated with uh, transmission, including manufacturing here in the United States and the construction jobs that will be forthcoming with the Build Back Better plan? Thank you very much, Congresswoman, for the question. There is tremendous, you know, I think a lot of the focus has been on the work that's going to be related to the actual construction of the turbines and the wind farms, but transmission carries with it tremendous job creation potential as well as manufacturing, as you spoke about. Um, it's been referenced that in order to deliver this much power to shore and to move the power on land, uh, high voltage cable is going to be necessary to move this power. The United States currently only has one factory that manufactures uh, this kind of cable. There's tremendous potential for additional manufacturing resources and manufacturing locations to be cited here in the state because rest, the rest of the product will have to be sourced um, from other nations at this point until we increase domestic uh, capacity for production. In terms of construction, you know, it will be both on land. Um, we as a company are committed to building only buried uh, transmission infrastructure, no overhead lines, uh, particularly in densely populated communities, but we as a company are committed to buried uh, transmission only. So you'll see um, roadway construction to bury utility lines and to move this power. And then there's the jobs that will be created offshore in terms of uh, collector platforms and other uh, in water infrastructure that are going to be necessary. But then we also have to have the conversation about the vessel fleet. Um, there's been much discussion about that as well in terms of the actual construction of the farms. 
but that uh, pertains to the transmission industry as well, making sure that we have enough domestic vessels, Jones Act compliant vessel, vessels to do this work. Well, I, I thank you for that. I sub, uh, I'm the, the subcommittee chair for the, the defense appropriations. And I've been holding uh, workforce hearings on this and manufacturing and working with our, our suppliers uh, and knowing that we need to do more here at home. And so we're putting together a plan. I think that will have a, a multiplying effect not only for the Department of Defense and for its needs, but for the needs of uh, our entire country to become more self more self sufficient when it comes to manufacturing. So we look forward to working with you and um, having this be uh, a big success for the United States. Reduce uh, carbon emissions, increase uh, electricity transmission, and create win win. So thank you, thank you all for testifying today. Thank you, Representative McCollum. Um, I'm not sure the order next, but I'm going to jump in. Re I was in terms of seniority and recognize Representative Harrell. Five minutes of questions. Are you there, Representative Harrell? If not, I will go to Representative Tiffany and we'll return to Representative. Representative Tiffany, you are recognized for five minutes of questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for um, deferring on Representative Harrell. I'm sure she'll be back soon. Um, Mr. Bush, um, should NEPA be streamlined for all projects, not just uh, renewable energy projects? Yes. The bottom line is we have created a nightmare of trying to get any sort of energy project cited and built in the United States. There's no reason why we can't set some reasonable timelines to get something approved. And a reasonable timeline is in the neighborhood of three years, not 30 days, not three months, but in three years or so, we should be able to do all the necessary studies, all the necessary reviews to approve or disapprove a project because thank, at that point the appeals start yeah thank thank you mr bush i really appreciate that answer uh ms mcintyre same question uh should nepa be streamlined for all projects not just renewable energy projects no we do not believe that thank you um so uh, um in fairness to you ms mcintyre um you just joined nrdc it sounds like in the last year or so um have you ever asked the people at nrdc why they were not advocating for better transmission lines years ago we all know the stories that came out of california in regards to pacific gas and electric where they had antiquated lines some of them led to the catastrophic fires that happened out in california um, why was nrdc not advocating for uh, better transmission lines back then? I do not know. I was not here at the time, and so I can't even state if that is actually a true statement. Yeah, I think if you look back, you'll see that NRDC has fought those things tooth and nail, as well as various um, uh, uh, projects like or, or um, plants like nuclear and coal plants that have been shut down across California. And of course, you now have your lights on half the time and you pay twice as much for your electricity. That's only slightly hyperbole. Um, does NRDC take any dollars from foreign interest to uh, fund your um, efforts? No, we do not. You don't take any money from foreign interests? No, we don't. So um, that um, information that has been out there is inaccurate that NRDC is taking money from foreign interests. I would say so. I don't know what information is out there, but um, we do not take money from foreign interests. Yeah, okay. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I want to correct the record in regards to um, some testimony that we saw here from um, the person from NRDC. In regards to, um, I would read from testimony here that's in the written testimony, the February 2021 cold snap sent millions of Texans into days of cold and darkness because of the failures of the state electricity system, which is isolated from other regional grids. 
And this is a message that has been uh, persistent amongst those that insist we must get rid of fossil fuels. That's actually not the case. Uh, let me read to you from an article from the Wall Street Journal, just uh, a piece of it here. Solar and wind power fell 80% and 55% respectively. Solar 80%, wind 55%. And for those people that were really paying attention to the massive outage in Texas, which had catastrophic effects for some people's lives, um, it was the wind turbines that shut down. The wind turbines that were supposed to be able to keep things going, and it's because there's been so much incentive for um, uh, so-called green energy to be produced, those incentives from the government have made it that it's been worthwhile. Without those incentives, they'd probably not survive. And I have to tell you, I am deeply concerned, especially in the upper Midwest, because a few years ago, when we had a couple severely cold winters, it got, uh, when it uh, exceeded 25 below, got colder than 25 below, the wind turbines in a uh, farm, uh, a wind farm, in St. Cloud, Minnesota, near St. Cloud, Minnesota, shut down at the very worst time possible. And that's why I call this the green fantasy, because you have to have base load power. These intermittent power sources that were that is being advocated for, wind and solar, do not have, keep the lights on when you get catastrophic weather events, like in Texas, like in Northern Minnesota from a few years ago. Uh, I believe the Biden administration should be investing in all types of transmission of um, energy products and not shutting down Keystone XL and not shutting down Line 5, which they're threatening to through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan that may leave people in the dark in the Upper Midwest. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tiffany, Representative Tiffany. Are there any other members that wish to ask any questions? Not hearing any, um, I'm going to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you, witnesses, to please respond to these questions in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these um, responses. Mr. Chairman, I believe Ms. Harrell is now with us, if you would be so kind to I allow see. her to testify. Representative Harrell, have you, are you there and ready to ask questions? She, Mr. Chairman, she is logging on as we speak. All right, and we will wait or representative. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Representative Harrell, as soon as you're able, please begin your questions. Uh, we see you, Representative Harrell. Oh, sorry. Okay, how about that? Can you see? That, how about now? Can you hear fine. me okay? We now recognize you for five minutes of questions. Are you ready? Yes, we sir. All right. Okay. Do you want me to stay until the end? Thank, thank you. Tom, Tiffany, yeah. you're not muted. Hey, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, apologize. I just ran back from another committee, but I had um, a couple of questions for Mr. Fisher. Um, during the Trump administration, the Department of Interior crafted a handful of rules to update the Endangered Species Act. Um, this administration has recently begun to kind of roll these uh, reforms back into play. And this effort to roll these changes back to prior to um, President Trump's administration will result in more expansive critical habitat designations and lengthen uh, and lengthier Section 7 consultation. Uh, my question is this. How could this impact timelines? How could this impact the timelines for the development of transmission projects? It will extend the permitting process for sure, especially in the case of with uh, federal nexus, where you are also 
doing a NEPA analysis. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and what I'm concerned about is, I mean, we see that in the private industry as well, and there seems to be some kind of inconsistencies. And I understand that across public lands and across different uh, various lands, these studies they can chew up a lot of time and really um, play havoc when we're talking about energy development on federal lands. Um, and we're already seeing these the lawsuits that, that pop up um, to stop the projects, but how would more ESA uh, litigation impact the ability to get these transmission projects completed? Well, it's, it's hard to speculate on what ultimately the litigation, how it would impact. Uh, we do know uh, for certain that it would slow the process down and worst case scenario, it would stop the project altogether. Right. And so I'm, I'm just hopeful that, um, and I said this earlier, you know, that, that we're finding ways that we can work together and, and not impact one industry over another or private sector over another. And be, I think very honest with ourselves and, and not only green energy or transmission lines or oil and gas, but we really need to see how these, um, how these rules and how these uh, uh, administrative um, rules and regulations are going to have an impact not only on oil and gas, but the transmission lines. I mean, you can't have because I'm what I'm afraid of is that we'll have one industry uh, versus, you know, the transmission lines and they'll be each held to a different standard. And so um, I, I do appreciate uh, your responses. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Now I'll ask the same question again. Is there any member that wishes to ask any questions? Not hearing any, I would like to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, as I pointed out before, members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses and we're gonna ask the witnesses to please respond to these uh, in writing under committee rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing. And the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there's no further business, without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned. And I wanna thank all the witnesses and the members for being
Test, test. 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 How do you want this? This usually connects. This is usually the right one. I think it's because the wires are so hideous. Test. This is Huffman, right? And it's a hybrid? Yeah. <laughs> How's HRS? Is it, where are they? Is where somebody are coming up? I saw up? Huffman's name here. You know, your favorite person. Daryl. Yeah. He was coming up here to test, but I said there's still a hearing going on. OK. Well, yeah. Randy's are up.
test.
Booth eight, um, Jesse is supposed to be signing on the platform now. Ha, ha, ha. 